Hi nurses, we're back and our topic for discussion today is anesthesia and anesthetics, how they're used. Here I've given you an example of, you can see there is a nurse preparing to take a patient to surgery. She's given report to the anesthetist, the person who gives the anesthesia. We all know when patients are taken to surgery, of course, we have a great degree of anxiety. These patients are put to sleep and typically what happens, they're given drugs like midazolam, which is a benzodiapine, fentanyl, which is an opiate, or well, propofol, it's one of those knockout types. But anyway, whatever it is, the doctor decides what he's going to use and the particular situation. That's not all there is to it. Prior to going into surgery, they do things like timeout, and uh, you have to do a complete checklist to make sure you have everything done correctly, and that's done several times to make sure you have the correct information. Let's talk a little bit about mitral valve regurgitation. Uh, there are two types. And mitral valve regurgitation, I'm sorry, regurgitation can be caused so there's like a sudden damage to the myocardium, to the mitral valve, and this results in sort of like blood flow backing up. Um, some of the causes will include myocardial infarction, which causes death to the heart muscle, endocarditis, blunt trauma. And patients with mitral valve regurgitation may show um, no symptoms for quite a long time and then sometimes they become extremely fatigued, short of breath, ankle edema, systolic murmur, and just all kinds. They get really miserable towards the end because they just are not able to do function as efficiently. Naturally what happens, uh, the heart is damaged, the valves are damaged, so you get like a backflow of blood, which in itself makes it difficult for that patient to breathe. I wanted to discuss with you some other um, cardiac things that you might not be familiar with, some procedures like cardiac catheterization. And cardiac catheterization is usually done in patients. Um, it's a procedure that's done in the, in, the, in the lab, in the cath lab. Echocardiogram is another one. Things like the ejection fraction. Cardiac catheterization, in fact, is amongst one of those tests used to measure the ejection fraction. And the normal is usually 55 to 70 percent. In patients with poor ejection fraction, they have such difficulty breathing, very little capacity because th it is obvious that, and you probably won't see this like if you work on a surgical floor, you really need to work in a place like an intensive care where you, these patients are closely monitored. Now, ejection fraction is the amount of blood that is ejected from the left ventricle each time the heart contracts. And a poor ejection fraction suggests that there is a need for further intervention, mainly because there's some damage to the heart muscle that it is not able to do its job efficiently. It's quite a long story. So I've worked in uh, where patients are waiting for a heart, and they're usually very tired, and they can do very little for themselves because they have that it's added effort when you have a damaged heart. Last but not least, I wanted to discuss what happens when patients come out of surgery and some of them are quite disoriented. They come out after they've had anesthesia and they make comments like, where am I nurse? My mouth feels very dry. Naturally they've been given drugs like atropine and atropine is not only used for surgical intervention, it's also used in a code setting too, a code blue setting. But it's used to dry up the secretions of these patients when they go to surgery and they come out with an extremely dry mouth and it seems like they beg for water and some of them are not able to have water right away. So they have we swab their mouths with, you know, maybe a cold sponge or so. But part of that is because of the medication itself. And I've seen patients come out of surgery and they're so confused, they don't know where they are and you're trying to reorient them. I remember brain patients, sometimes we'd like to have to let them sleep a little bit longer to sleep off that anesthesia to feel normal again. So take the time this time to go to dearnurses.org. It's just packed with helpful information of this nature. Hope you've enjoyed learning.